Welcome to the case presentations from the fourth annual Basic and Clinical Immunology for the Busy Clinician course. I'm Dr. Len Calabrese, head of the R.J. Faisenmeyer Center for Clinical Immunology, and I have a great case to share with you uh, that exemplifies some of the major teaching points of our immunology boot camp. So case one is a 38-year-old man who had a recent history of a metastatic melanoma and he was referred to the rheumatologist for polyarthralgia and fatigue. Aside from the melanoma, he had an unremarkable past medical history. He was treated with the biologic agent ipilimumab, which is a monoclonal antibody directed against CTLA-4. He received this um, at a 10 milligram per kilogram dose, and I will say that's high dose, every three weeks and tolerated this quite well, got a series of four doses. Um, should be noted that his melanoma made an excellent response, but he developed this profound fatigability um, uh, and uh, a, a new onset uh, uh, and crescendoing headache, which he said was nagging for about a week. So evaluation at this time um, revealed this uh, uh, multiple areas of joint pain with early morning stiffness. Um, he had some tenderness uh, in the wrist area um, and uh, difficulty moving his shoulders uh, with an active range of motion. Um, uh, blood pressure was normal, general exam was unremarkable, um, and uh, visible regression of one of the sentinel lesions. So. Uh, he had elevated acute phase reactants, so set rate of 58, uh, elevated CRP, negative uh, rheumatoid factor, and ACPA. Um, and his uh, 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 hormones, uh, which were drawn uh, for this fatigability, um, revealed that uh, his thyroid was uh, normal at this time. Um, he had a normal baseline ACTH. Um, and a slightly suppressed uh, TSH. So uh, not much to make of that at this juncture. Because of the headache, he underwent um, neuroimaging, um, uh, which I'll show you in a second. So clinical considerations here from the rheumatology perspective, um, this really uh, had features of polymyalgia rheumatica because of this uh, proximal type of uh, uh, aches and pains and elevated acute phase reactants, but he also had some oligoarticular joint tenderness, um, so he actually had some arthritis. Um, uh, and uh, the question of whether this was related to his treatment or not uh, was raised. Um, there was no explanation for this profound fatigability at this time. Uh, uh, his uh, uh, baseline studies were, were not diagnostic of anything further. Um, but because of the crescendoing headache in an oncology patient, he underwent MRI imaging. And this is pretty dramatic by anyone's standard. This is a gadolinium-enhanced T1 uh, 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 sagittal image uh, of the brain showing marked increased signal intensity in this hypophysal area. And this is uh, a, a, a neuroradiographic uh, example of hypothesitis. Now let's go back and put this all together. So if we try to coordinate this with our basic science, what I've shown you here is the normal expansion contraction of uh, humoral immune, uh, cellular immunity during the course of an integrated immune response. What you can see is that upon challenge with a new antigen, uh, particularly in a memory compartment, a single T cell can become over a million T cells within a week. Part of the homeostatic process is this contraction phase. Um, and uh, this is mediated by numerous uh, cellular receptors and intracellular pathways, but it actually induces uh, deactivation and um, uh, programmed cell death of these cells. And then uh, the remaining cells are shuttled into a memory compartment. This is the job of doing business uh, if you are mounting a T cell response. Now, two of the mechanisms whereby unbridled immune activation is reined in are called immunologic checkpoints. This is a, you know, I'm giving you a very high altitude description of this. 
On the top in the A panel, you can see a professional uh, antigen uh, uh, presenting cell, dendritic cell, presenting an antigen in the context of MHC to a cognate T cell. The uh, orange uh, ligands are CD8086 um, uh, binding to CD28. That is the second signal, which, you, as you know, is vital, vital for uh, T cell activation. Once activated, um, uh, the T cell now starts expressing a, an additional uh, 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 ligand called CTLA4. CTLA4 is more avid for CD8086 than uh, CD28. And once it is engaged, it provides a negative signal, a signal to downregulate immune activation and proliferation. If the cells, however, reach the periphery, such as infiltrating a tumor or battling an infection, such as hepatitis C or HIV, um, they then um, uh, have a second checkpoint. Um, cells, uh, T cells that can't defeat the, uh, the new danger signal, the invading pathogen, if they're left uh, to uh, continuous activation, there'll be tremendous collateral damage of the host. So a second ligand, PD-1, um, is expressed, and it uh, binds to its cognate ligand, either PD-L1 or PD-L2, which can be expressed on a wide variety of tissues. And this leads to the phenotype uh, uh, that we now refer to as the exhausted T cell. It's still functioning, but it's tired. It's not as inflammatory. It doesn't secrete as much cytokines. It's not as cytotoxic. So. Why do we need them? Well, as I've tried to make the point already, if you had unbridled immune activation, there would be tremendous collateral uh, 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 damage to the host. Um, over the past decade, one of the greatest advances in immunobiology has occurred in the development of checkpoint therapy. These are monoclonal antibodies directed against these two checkpoints, um, and they are both commercially available. There are antibodies that target CTLA-4, which um, neutralizes the first checkpoint, and there are antibodies now that not, uh, uh, neutralize PD-1 or PD-L1, um, and that is the second checkpoint. Um, on this figure, uh, on the left, you can see pre- and post-treatment of several uh, severe types of cancer. Uh, first is non-small cell lung cancer, showing regression of a peripheral tumor, and in the uh, bottom uh, image, uh, a metastatic melanoma um, uh, uh, melting away with uh, anti-CTLA-4 therapy, the same therapy, therapy was given to our patient. Um, these therapies are now the new forefront of cancer immunotherapy, a dream uh, that has now been realized for 30 years. Uh, Various forms of immunotherapy have been uh, investigated, none of which have been highly effective or have been severely toxic. The right panels show the collateral damage. If you t attack the checkpoints, um, you now take your foot off the brake, and what you see is the, a, a variety of immunopathologies which can be experienced by such patients, such as dermatitis, colitis, and hepatitis. Let's look at this in a little more uh, granular fashion. Um, these two forms of checkpoint therapy, which are revolutionizing cancer in general, um, can uh, be met with a high frequency of what we call immune-related adverse events. These are um, uh, uh, due to overactivity of cellular immunity. They are generally more common with anti-CTLA-4 than anti-PD-1. They're generally more uh, frequent with the higher doses, such as this patient got. Um, and as I will show you, immunosuppressive therapy is often required. Um, uh, there are also some recent data to show that if you're a cancer patient that has an underlying autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis or Crohn's disease or others, these drugs may make this worse. I will show you in a second some summary data from uh, one of the most important um, uh, single center experiences published to date from Memorial Sloan Kettering 
looking at the clinical experience with nearly 300 patients treated with uh, the anti-CTLA-4 uh, drug, showing that one-third of them required glucocorticoids to treat the immune-related adverse events. And 10% of those, 10% uh, of the overall cohort actually required a second biologic, usually a TNF inhibitor, mostly to treat colitis. There are now protocols combining these agents with new uh, um, and even uh, more prevalent adverse events that we'll have to keep our eye on. Here's a table uh, showing a kind of a laundry list of these immune-related adverse events. The point being is that virtually any organ system is involved. On the right, I've showed you the most common dermatologic, ranging from just erythematous rashes to Stevens-Johnson and TEN, colitis ranging from diarrhea to uh, life-threatening uh, bowel perforation, hepatotoxicity, again, ranging from grade one, transaminitis to sub-acute uh, uh, hepatic necrosis. Interestingly, endocrinopathy has been a major target with uh, pituitary, thyroid, adrenal um, uh, 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 targeting, all um, uh, often requiring hormone replacement therapy. Um, uh, lung uh, inducing in, uh, interstitial lung disease can be severe in a few percent, and we're now just at the beginning of understanding musculoskeletal complaints, and as of um, uh, the beginning of August 2015, the first uh, uh, clinical case series is now published in the Annals of Rheumatic Diseases by the Johns Hopkins group, uh, led by Dr. Bingham. Um, of note in our patient was hypophysitis, and this is a rare uh, uh, form of uh, disease of, uh, uh, by any definition, but with ipilimumab, anti-CTLA-4, this has been seen in about 4% of patients. I'll comment on it in a minute. This is a timeline showing when uh, clinicians can expect to see these complications. Uh, skin comes first, uh, bowel second, and then um, uh, uh, liver and, and endocrine. Uh, the uh, hypophysal uh, complication, uh, which often requires lifelong pituitary uh, uh, hormone replacement, um, sh shows up after the first month or two um, uh, and then uh, tends to downgrade. This is an interesting translational um, uh, article uh, which was published uh, last year which showed that the mechanism belying this hypophysitis was actually um, the fact that uh, these neuroendocrine cells uh, uh, at the base of the brain actually express CTLA-4. Uh, the function of this is not quite clearly known, but animal models, which I'm demonstrating here uh, pathologically, show that when exposed to anti-CTLA-4, they can develop a rich uh, hypophysitis uh, infiltrated with T cells um, uh, as well as resultant um, uh, pituitary dysfunction and thyroid disease. So in summary, I'm now just giving you a snapshot. I'm assuming that most people listening to this are not oncologists, but you are people that function as clinical immunologists. You, you're taking basic clinical immunology uh, and applying it to patients. So whether you're a rheumatologist or a gastroenterologist or a dermatologist or an endocrinologist or a generalist, I guarantee you that within the next year, you will probably see one or more of these patients. At the Cleveland Clinic, we're now seeing one to two a week in rheumatology, one of the rare forms of complications. This patient, I will just tell you in closing, um, uh, was treated with high-dose glucocorticoids. Uh, the polymyalgia picture and the polyarthritis picture melted away, um, and uh, these drugs were discontinued after several months. Uh, the patient did go on to develop um, uh, uh, hypoendocrine function, is now on uh, broad-based endocrine replacement. So number one, in summary, checkpoints are critical to controlling immune proliferation. Two, um, these checkpoints can be exploited in chronic immune activation and exhaustion um, uh, settings, and cancer immunotherapy um, 
uh, has arrived, and there's a new horizon uh, of, of therapy here. And all of us who practice clinical immunology both will be um, drawn into this. So thank you for uh, uh, this, uh, sharing this interesting case with me. Please uh, come back to our website for many other offerings and look for uh, the news on uh, Immunology Boot Camp 5 coming up in February of 2017 in Las Vegas.